I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Cyberpunk Edge Runners was released on Netflix in September 2022. From showrunner Rafal Yaki and directed by Hiroyuki Imaishi, the series is a joint production between Studio Trigger and CD Projekt Red. A prequel to the video game Cyberpunk 2077 by CD Projekt Red, itself set in a universe created by Mike Pondsmith, mastermind of the tabletop RPG Cyberpunk from 1988. The story follows David Martinez, a gifted student at Arasaka Academy born in the wrong part of town. After a personal tragedy, David installs a cybernetic implant called a Sandevastin, which gives him superhuman speed. He drops out of school, and we watch as he begins his life as an edge runner, a mercenary in the city's underclass. I love this show. It's one of my favorite things to come out of 2022. As a fan of Studio Trigger, I think this is one of the best, if not the best, show they've worked on so far. Sure, it might be predictable. You might know how it ends partway through episode one, but that's not really a problem to me. There's a playbook that Edge Runners follows, and the show follows it all the way through until the end. It's thrilling and tragic. Bombastic and heartbreaking. The show is unabashedly optimistic and deeply cynical, all at once. But if there's one feeling the show left me with by the end, more than anything, it was comfort. Because even though it takes place in the future, it's a show that says a whole lot more about today. So, what is it like to live in a place like Night City? A place where forces much larger than you move everything behind the scenes, and how does it feel to live in that place when the only thing you can do with your life is hold on to moments that will be lost in time, like tears in rain? Mass inequality. A deep seedy underworld, organized crime, and evil mega corporations. If there is anything this show wants you to know, it's that Night City is a god awful place. Now, I haven't played Cyberpunk 2077. I don't really play a whole lot of video games, to be honest. With the sole exception being a single game that I play using a $300 controller I had shipped from China. That is not a joke. It's in this box. Don't get me wrong. I've seen a few trailers and have since read through what happens to get a feel for the broad strokes of things. But going into this show, the only thing I really knew about this franchise was that Keanu Reeves was in the game. You're breathtaking. I came into this from the perspective of someone with no attachments or prior knowledge, and I don't see that as a bad thing. I usually try to experience media on its own terms, and to the show's credit, you don't need to know anything going in to understand what's happening. Although, I mean, it's not that hard to get across that this place sucks in just about every possible way. I want to talk about edge runners, and to do that. We need to talk about cyberpunk as a genre because there's more to it than neon lights and synthesizers. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, cyberpunk is a subgenre of science fiction defined as being characterized by countercultural antiheroes trapped in a dehumanized high-tech future. But that's just aesthetics, and if that's all there was to it, I don't think edge runners or the genre in general would have resonated with as many people as it has. There's even a bit of debate as to whether or not cyberpunk stories actually need to take place in the future, with Mr. Robot being a prime example. It's been held up as one of the best cyberpunk shows in recent memory, even though it has almost no fantastical gadgets and takes place in 2015, the same year it came out. It's really good. You should watch it. To me. The main conceit of cyberpunk is that for all the technology on display, futuristic or otherwise, it doesn't solve any of society's problems. Most people describe the genre as high tech, low life, and that's really what it boils down to. These stories are focused on desperate low class or marginalized people, basically anyone who doesn't fit into the norms of society. While they might be trying to fight injustice or save the world. That usually isn't the point. Most of the time, 
They're just doing whatever they can to survive. Edge Runners is the story of David's life, and it's sort of a slice of life in a way, a portrait of Night City and all the struggles that come with living in it. We're told that David was a model student before abandoning his high school life, but he didn't really think any of the things he accomplished up to that point would amount to anything. And just to hammer that point home, the only character who really believed he could make it through hard work and sheer determination alone dies halfway through episode one. There are only two choices for someone like David, becoming an edge runner and dying, or working his ass off in school or at a job with no hope of success, all while constantly being beat down by everyone around him and dying anyways. If those are the only two choices, why not take the option that gives you a sense of agency? In the end, that's what David chooses. To be with Lucy, Rebecca, Maine, Pillar, Dodio, Kiwi, and Falco, spending what little time he has with them, and loving them with everything he's got. This decision sets the entire story in motion, but I want to make the argument that this act, David donning the sand Deviston, becoming an edge runner, it isn't as rebellious as people make it out to be. This might be a bit of a hot take, but I go so far as to say that for most of the show, none of these guys are actually rebels with one exception, but it's not David. We'll get back to that. Because David isn't unique. Hell, everyone in his crew probably went through something similar to him. While we don't get to see much of their previous lives outside of Lucy, we do get enough to suggest that they've all had struggles of their own. From Maine's hallucinations of running alone in the desert, to Kiwi's casual advice to trust no one but yourself. Night City is filled with edge runners, but you get the impression pretty quickly that no one does it because they think it's a good idea. It's the kind of life we're told over and over doesn't end well. With all that we see of Night City, with how it treats people like David, born without money, status, or influence, it's not hard imagining others being forced into the same position, choosing between two bad options if the city doesn't kill you first. But the thing is, Night City kind of needs edge runners to exist. David and his crew can go about their day saying this place sucks as much as they like, but the things they end up doing are pretty important. I mean, people like Faraday exist in this world. Being a fixer is a thing and it's not really a secret, to the point where someone can casually pull up a directory of them. It seems like engaging in a bit of espionage is somewhat common and necessary for these mega corporations to operate, with fixers organizing edge runners to do some dirty work. It's all part of the machinery that makes Night City run. And that's exactly it. If what you do is essential in allowing this system to function at all, then that isn't being rebellious. David, his crew, they might think they're sticking it to the man by choosing this lifestyle on the fringes, but most of the show is them taking job after job, doing exactly as told, and getting paid for it. They're not rebels, they're contract workers. Choose to be a salary man or choose to be an edge runner, it doesn't matter. Both those outcomes lead to the exact same place. The only difference is that one supports the city from the inside, and the other supports it through other means. But it's not just people like David, the ones at the bottom that suffer from this system. Things are a bit more complicated. While David is our point of view in tonight's city, every once in a while, we do get glimpses of life closer to the top. Katsuo Tanaka, the kid who bullied David and son of an Arasaka executive. His dad doesn't care that he got punched in the face. In fact, he is all too eager to toss Katsuo to the side if it means getting a leg up himself. Faraday, the fixer who dreams of rising higher through hard work and the sweat on his brow. That was Gloria's dream too. And Faraday got just as far, dead in the street with the people he was trying to please not even giving him the time of day. This random Arasaka employee, whose name I don't even know, higher up the chain, but still lowest on the totem pole, essentially left to die to handle a problem he didn't cause, because no one else was going to take the blame. Now, don't get me wrong, 
these guys suck, but their lives of luxury hide the reality of their situation. They are just as disposable as anyone else. Like I said at the start, if this show wants you to know anything, it's that Night City is a god-awful place. And that's true for everyone. It's a monolith that doesn't care about any of the people living in it. Not Tanaka, not Faraday, and certainly not David. Because in the end, Night City is the main villain of this story. And in Cyberpunk, that villain is impossible to overcome. To me, these stories are deeply cynical. They're not usually about changing the world because the genre works under the assumption that cyberpunk worlds can't be changed. And you know who else thinks that? It's pretty obvious that nobody is going to change the world fundamentally. What these characters are fighting for is to carve out a very small piece of the world around them where they can be themselves. Edge Runners is the story of David's life, a character trying to make a place for himself and the people he loves. But as a portrait of Night City and the struggles that come with living in it, the show is mainly an exploration of what Night City does to anyone who tries to play by its rules. Cybernetics are a staple of cyberpunk. Hell, cybernetics and cyberware are an important part of 2077, but Edge Runners uses it in a slightly different way. Now, a lot of what I said earlier can be applied to both Edge Runners and 2077. They take place in the same universe, so that isn't a surprise, but there is a difference in medium, and that can change the way some ideas come across, which is something Yaki seems to be aware of. Because in the video game, it's all about the immersion and the power fantasy of being in Night City, where for the show, we explore things and topics that were not possible in that specific experience of a video game. Cyberware is part of the power fantasy in 2077, inherently, even if that wasn't the goal for the story. Just like most RPGs, you can upgrade your character as things progress. You're basically encouraged to as things get increasingly difficult. Cyberware allows you to do more things. New parts, new abilities. They're an extension of the character. It's a power fantasy. That's just the built-in mechanics for the game. And while the same thing kind of happens in Edge Runners with David frequently getting new parts, I don't think it serves the same purpose. I mean, the show ends with the main character dying in a one-sided beatdown not having changed the world and, I don't know, I think it's hard to get power fantasy out of that. You know, I was listening to a podcast Yaki was on where he talked a bit about the cyberware in 2077, the logic behind why people need immunosuppressants, how they act like transplanted organs, that sort of stuff. And then he said something that caught my attention. It's like. Many cyberware and the cyberpunk IP are subscription-based. This isn't something that's explored in the game as far as I'm aware, and it's not in the show. As far as I can tell, this is just a piece of unused lore. But the fact that Yaki brought it up when talking about the show is interesting. Now, I have no idea if this concept was something the writers wanted to use at some point, or if it was in earlier drafts of the script. But it wouldn't surprise me if it was because the idea of not owning parts of who you are comes up a lot in this show. Lucy was a literal child slave for Arasaka. David's dreams are his mom's. Even people's deaths can be bought and sold through underground black market BDs. Agency is a big part of the show. David is trying to carve out a place for himself and his crew, an expression of his bodily autonomy. But there is kind of a disconnect between that goal and how he goes about achieving it. Like I said earlier, edge running is essentially the same as having a job. David does it to get the things he wants, and he installs more cyberware partially to get better at it, because the better he is, the more he'll have. At the same time though, that ends up helping the city more too. David's goals and Night City's goals are not the same. 
From what we see in the show, Night City as a system is built to support corporations, giving them power and influence over almost everything. NCPD is privately owned, so is the trauma team. Arasaka, a conglomerate with a military weapons division, has a school. David went there. These companies have control over people's lives and well-being. And so Night City's goal as a system then is to keep things that way. To force people into positions where that is the result. And to produce citizens who will support those corporations in whatever form that takes. Whether or not David realizes it, the reality of being an edge runner is that it helps Night City more than it helps him. Like I said, the city needs edge runners to exist. They're an important part of making it all run, doing things no one else will. And the corporations behind it all get even larger because of that. David might get money doing his job, enough money to buy a bit of comfort. But as someone trying to carve out a place for himself and his loved ones in a system that wants to control them, he is undermining his own goals, plain and simple. That being said, what does any of this have to do with cyberware? Well, just like in 2077, cyberware augments people's abilities. It extends their owner's reach, helping them accomplish their goals. So, here's the big question. If that's true, if cyberware is an extension of its owner, and David is actively working against his own interests by doing his job, when he starts exchanging parts of himself to be a better edge runner, then who do those parts really belong to? The way I see it, the cyberware in the show isn't an extension of the characters. It's an extension of the city. When David installed the Zen Deviston, it gave him the power he wanted to punch Katsuo in the face. But he got that power by grafting a literal piece of Arasaka property onto his body, which he then used to do jobs on the city's behalf. And that pretty much sums it up. Getting anything out of this system means giving up parts of yourself for the city to use. No matter how righteous or noble someone's goals might be, that's the cost of playing this game. It's tempting for people to think that they're different, that they can take advantage of this system, play the game, install more cyberware, and live out their fantasies. But the deck is stacked against them. The more they give, the more they become tools of the city, and the more things stay the same. There comes a point when the city's goals completely overrides their own, and when that inevitably happens, how much of them will be left? Cyberpsychosis. Hallucinations of old dreams that have long since disappeared. A person trying to remember who they were before being consumed by the city. It's fitting that Adam Smasher, the only one who never had that happen to them, is the final person David faces. In Night City, he's the ideal citizen, and that citizen takes the form of the shell of a man completely devoted to Arasaka, willing to crush anything to protect their bottom line. How many times have we heard stories of people taking jobs they hated for the money? Money to accomplish all sorts of lofty goals and dreams. How many times have we heard those stories end with those people completely trapped by that job, not having done any of the things they wanted to do? So, how does it feel to live in a place like Night City? How does it feel to try and play by its rules? It feels like slowly becoming a product, a commodity, just another cog in the machine. In 1982, the movie Blade Runner was released, loosely based on the 1968 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick and directed by Ridley Scott, the story follows former police officer Rick Deckard tasked with terminating four rogue androids or replicants. Escaping from an off-world colony, the replicants return to Earth with a single goal, 
to find Dr. Eldon Tyrell, founder of the Tyrell Corporation and their creator. Yeah, this was inevitable. Any discussion of cyberpunk always comes back to Blade Runner for good reason. It's a foundational piece of cyberpunk media. If you haven't watched this movie though, don't worry about it, but if that is you, I feel like I should give a bit of context for what Blade Runner is because it might not be what you expect. Looking at clips of this thing and given its reputation, you might think that the movie is an action-packed thriller. Let me tell you right now, uh, it's not. Blade Runner is very moody and atmospheric, which is just a nice way of saying slow. It is one of the slowest paced movies I have ever watched. To be clear, I love it and think it's great, but for anyone who hasn't seen the movie and decides to watch it, know what it is you're getting yourself into. There are long scenes that feel like they go absolutely nowhere, and even with all that time, almost none of it is spent exploring any of the futuristic tech on display in this version of 2019 Los Angeles. It has very little action, not a lot of fights or shootouts, and what action is there can leave a lot to be desired. I know it sounds like I'm harping on the movie, but none of that really bothers me personally, because the movie isn't about those things. At its core, Blade Runner is about people and their experience, what they see in the world, how they feel about it. While the movie did help to define cyberpunk aesthetic, that's not all it did. It might not be fast-paced or the most exciting thing in the world, but the story at the heart of Blade Runner is the basis for a lot of modern cyberpunk, including Edge Runners. This movie basically lays out the entire trajectory of the show. The main antagonist of Blade Runner is the leader of the Replicants group, a character named Roy Batty. At about two-thirds of the way through the movie, he eventually meets Dr. Tyrell and we find out why the Replicants went so far to find him. For various in-movie reasons, Replicants have four-year lifespans and each of them were nearing the end. But as products of the Tyrell Corporation, they searched for Dr. Tyrell as a last-ditch attempt to get more time. Something he isn't able to give them. The final showdown happens between Deckard and Roy, and in what can be seen as a very anticlimactic ending, Roy just dies. Deckard doesn't kill him. In fact, Deckard was about to fall to his own death if Roy didn't catch him first. Roy's body just fails, all on its own. His last moments are on a rooftop, alone in the rain with Deckard, as he laments that all the memories he's made throughout his short life will be lost forever. Roy might be the antagonist, but there are a lot of parallels between him and David, marginalized people who face injustice because of their status as individuals, being a replicant and being low class. They are dehumanized by the city around them. Roy is literally a product, and David slowly turns into one as the show progresses. But the real tragedy at the heart of these stories is that they both fell into the same trap. Roy turned to the Tyrell Corporation believing that the people at the highest levels of power could save him. David became an edge runner, giving up more and more of his body to the city, believing he could carve out a place for himself if he did. These stories are about people that lost everything because they turned to the structures that oppressed them to accomplish their goals. If you've watched Blade Runner, it was abundantly clear from the start that David was not going to survive going down the path he was on. But here's the thing about Blade Runner. It was very much a product of its time. The cyberpunk movement Blade Runner came out of was 80s counterculture, a response to what artists saw. They told stories with strong opinions that they didn't shy away from. Like, it's really hard to understate this. You cannot look at Blade Runner's LA and not see it as a blatant critique of capitalism. More specifically, the hyper-capitalist sentiments of the 80s. With the rise of neoliberalism, there was a big push for limited market regulation and for private industries to take over most, if not all, public services. 
There's more to neoliberalism as an ideology than that, but this is what Blade Runner was taking direct aim at. Rampant consumerism and advertising, megacorporations taking over everything with an intense class divide as the result. That was the world Blade Runner showcased, all things which are staples of cyberpunk today. But for some people, those were not far-off fantasies. That was the end result of a worldview that thought putting a price tag on everything was a good idea. Just to cover my bases though, most of what I've just said is specific to cyberpunk in the US. Japan actually had its own branch of cyberpunk that came about seemingly independently at around the same time with series like Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira in 1982. Still counterculture and exploring very similar things, but born under slightly different circumstances with its own nuances. That's a whole other can of worms we don't need to get into here. I bring all of this up because I want to stress it is impossible to untangle Blade Runner from the context that created it. This wasn't just speculative fiction. It was an expression of anxieties people had at the time it came out, a vision of the present. The playbook Blade Runner lays out isn't just about style or aesthetic. It's a template for a story about today. And to me, that's what cyberpunk really is. To throw my hat into the ring as to whether or not cyberpunk stories need to take place in the future, I say no, because I think that sort of misses the point. As much as I love stories that inspire me and give me hope, that doesn't always speak to how things feel. In David's story, I see someone part of a vicious cycle, a person's slow transformation into an extension of the system they are a victim of, giving up more and more of himself to achieve a goal that isn't his. A story where in the end, everything stays exactly the same. David's struggle isn't that far off from what a lot of people experience. It's exaggerated, but who hasn't felt his anger, his contempt, his rage at a system he is powerless to fight against? I think it was best put by Evan Pushak in his book, Escape Into Meaning. Cyberpunk turns those messy feelings into a place where it's no longer necessary to resist the splintering pressures of society because the fight's over and we lost. Cyberpunk cities are born out of current anxieties, and as strange as this might sound, I find comfort in that. It's a comfort that comes from a deep sense of empathy. In the same tradition as many other cyberpunk works before it, Edge Runners takes all the fears and worries we might have about the world and tells a story about what it feels like to live in the present day. To me, that's the power of cyberpunk, why I think it still resonates with so many people. Most of us don't have the ability to change the world, so these stories put characters in a position where that isn't an option. And like us, they just have to survive. It's dour and kind of depressing, honestly, but I think fiction exists to explore all kinds of emotions. And those feelings of powerlessness are just as valid as anything else. But that's not all the genre can offer. I said at the very beginning that I didn't really see any of the characters in Edge Runners as rebels with one exception, and that was Lucy. Brought up as a child slave for Arasaka, Lucy is intimately aware, probably more than anyone else in the group, that the structures of Night City are just like the ones back then. And you can see that mindset in how she acts. For most of the show, she tries to hide her dive port, not wanting to be seen as the product she was raised as. It might not seem like it, but this is one of the very few acts of true rebellion throughout most of the show. Because in a system that wants control, that forces people into positions that support it in any form that takes, the only way to rebel is to reject that system outright, refuse to play its game. Lucy escaping Arasaka? Her hiding her dive port? 
It all comes from the same place, a rejection of everything society wants her to be. It's all summed up in her dream of going to the moon, escaping to a life beyond Night City. David called that dream naive in the beginning, but as the show progresses, he starts to realize how difficult it is for Lucy to maintain. She deep dives into Tanaka's mind when pushed into a corner. She continues to dive to protect David after Maine's death, all the while knowing that she is using a power that does not belong to her. It's not a coincidence that doing those things led to Faraday catching her. In Lucy, David gets to see the struggle of Night City play out before his eyes, and we watch as the spark of rebellion starts to grow within him as he slowly takes Lucy's dream to heart. Take a guess as to what movie showcases the exact same journey. At the end of Blade Runner, after being with Roy in his final moments, Deckard comes to understand the injustices Roy faced. He had hopes, fears, others that he loved and cared for. The only thing he wanted was a chance at life. And in light of that, Deckard makes a choice. He runs away with his love interest Rachel, escaping the city and leaving everything else behind. Roy's dream of a life outside the confines of the city lived on because of Deckard, just as David made sure Lucy's dream survived. Even though cyberpunk often depicts life in a place that will not change, that doesn't mean the desire for change goes away. Not every piece of cyberpunk media ends up going in this direction, but these stories can be just as much about people learning what it means to rebel. And that's how David's story ends, with his only act of true defiance. In his final moments, David gives his life so that Lucy can see her dream through. Rebelling in the same way she does, David rejects Adam Smasher's offer to be just like him and tells the physical embodiment of everything Night City represents to fuck off. Maybe the forces of Night City win in the end. Maybe it is useless to resist. But this is one spot where Edge Runner's optimism shines through. In a place that wants complete control, David learns to rebel by learning to dream, because the show makes the case that so long as someone can dream of a life beyond the current system, the hope for something better will never die. As always, thank you so much for watching. Happy 2023, everyone. I really tried to get this out last year, but stuff happened and then I got COVID, so that wasn't fun to deal with. If you want to see the extra stuff from the video, there's a link to that in the description as well as links to my socials. I'm at It's Kyle Robes on Twitter and Instagram, and I promise to try and do more stuff with those this year. If you want to support me financially, there's also a link to my coffee page. These videos take a lot of effort on my part to make, so any support is greatly appreciated if you have the means. But that's it from me. Whether you're new or have been here for a while, thanks for stopping by, and I'll see you next time. Shoots? <laughs>